I have a lot of questions, I'm sure all of you do. So I'll just start the discussion by going uh, right to something that we were chatting about uh, earlier this evening, uh, which is this concept of the future tense notion of the pre-state archive, the state in the making, the state on the verge of becoming. The portrayal in the photographs of the uh, Zionist imaginary and the, the tipu sin, the types that would characterize this um, Jewish state, this revival of Jewish statehood in the ancient <coughs> homeland. And as I thought about that, and as I was reading Rotem's book, I thought about, okay, well, what about the Palestinians? And you mentioned, you referred to the, to the others, mm -hmm. the in, people that were there before. They now uh, call themselves the state of Palestine, not the future state of Palestine. They call themselves the state of Palestine. Mm -hmm. In the United Nations, the placard in front of their ambassador says, state of Palestine. And is there a similar effort on their behalf oh, to create the same kind of pre-state archival mm -hmm. record for the state in the making, either through photography or other means, uh, and maybe you could address that a little bit. Absolutely. Um, I want you to know that I didn't pay Professor Zieferstein to say all these nice things about my book. <laughs> um, I just cast the check. No. <laughs> um, it's really interesting to look at how the Palestinian um, um, thinking through photographs of the same time period actually begins fairly early on. Um, we have, um, there's an amazing, amazing publication um, by Walid Khalidi called uh, Before Their Diaspora that accumulated photographs of Palestinian lives um, in pre-state Palestine and well before that during the 19th century as well. Photography becomes an official invention um, in 1839. And interestingly, the Middle East becomes almost immediately afterwards one of the most photographed regions in the world, um, thanks to um, improved means of travel and the rise of leisure culture across the world as well. So there are attempts that are being made over the past few decades to excavate that history um, that was, in many cases, demolished or ruined. Um, there are Israeli scholars like Rona Sela and Ariel Azulay that I've also mentioned that have done a lot of work to try and locate archives that were destroyed or looted um, in wars that happened and conflicts that happened um, throughout the 20th century. So we have that context within Palestine and Israel but there's also a broader context of Palestinian diaspora across the Middle East. And in that context, I want to mention one specific project that I think is fascinating and is also available online, and you can all access it if you're interested. It's the Arab Image Foundation um, that was created by a group of artists in um, Lebanon. Um, and it was created with that intention in mind to show the complexity and the nuances of daily lives of Arab communities across the Middle East that, that were completely erased from larger national and global narratives. Um, Akram Zatari, the amazing artist who's based here in the US um, most of the time, is one of the main leaders of that project and it's fascinating. I recommend to everybody to go take a look. And that possibility, what I think is key here, is that that possibility of forming a national photographic archive, what we see, and this goes beyond the story of Palestine and Israel and the Zionist movement, it's a key element in the shaping of a civic space. And we see that in, in parallel national stories throughout the 20th century. Mm -hmm. And we see it in works of artists that are now trying to give archives and create those spaces for marginalized communities worldwide. So this story is also a part of a larger fabric of photographic and political activity. Um, and I'm, 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 I feel very um, honored and humbled by the possibility of adding this story um, to this fabric. So just, uh, and please think of your questions because I don't want to, I want everyone to have a chance who has a question 
um, and Maura is going to moderate the Q and A. Right. But You're just one, ready. just one more from me. Um, so, fascinating history about the Jewish National Fund. Uh, you said earlier in the book, before they moved from The Hague to Jerusalem, mm -hmm. why were The Hague to begin with? Because they wanted to be in a neutral place during World War One. Yeah. Fascinating. Fascinating. Uh, sure. But there was a whole history of photography before the JNF. Yeah. Um, you mentioned Bonfil, the, the French photographer, mm -hmm. who was taking amazing photographs um, in Jerusalem, in particular in the late uh, 19th century. Uh, the American Colony Collection, the Jerusalem and East Mission Collection. And so what is it about the JNF photographs that differed from these earlier photographs. Uh, and as we come forward to today, I spent some time this afternoon on the JNF photo website in Hebrew, yep. but it wasn't the same experience that you talked about going there physically and and, and getting past the Arkon and, and everything. So can you talk about just that a little bit? Yes, absolutely. Um, what is really interesting about those systems that you've mentioned, the American colony is a great example. So the American colony photographic, photographic service was started by a couple, the Matson family. Um, the American colony was a self-sustained um, um, community, collective. What they were doing there was pretty intense, if you ever get to look through that history. So they launched a photographic service in order to um, make some more money for the colony by documenting daily events that happened throughout mostly Jerusalem, but also um, in other areas as well. Because they were Messianic Christians, basically hanging out waiting for Jesus to come, uh, whenever that is supposed to happen, um, <laughs> they had different access to different events. The way that they document and had documented daily lives was profoundly different from the commitments of the commissioned photographers who were working in the service of the needs of, of the Jewish National Fund. Now the Jewish National Fund creates the archive as part of a larger department at the time that was titled as the Department for um, Propaganda and Journalism. Um, I believe the exact, exact title was Education, Propaganda and Journalism. So they had a very particular goal in mind. They go out into the field with shooting scripts in a way that I think we can parallel to something else that was happening here in the US at the time, which is the RAFSA archive um, that produced um, astonishing works of the Great Depression era by photographers like Walker Evans and Dorothea Lang. The way that Stryker was working with his photographers um, could be easily paralleled with what happened um, in Jerusalem at the time. So the Matsons didn't have um, um, a political goal in mind. It wasn't part of their purview. So the collection that they produced, and one of the graduate students here at UCLA, Yair Agumon, um, has been doing amazing work as an artist with materials from that archive, really offers this expansive view of Palestine um, in a way that is slightly out of the scope of the interest of um, the JNF archive at the time. Um, so it's really interesting to see how the, I called it the um, operation software of the archive really defines the visual language that will be produced by its photographers. Tomorrow we'll sure, I'd you. be happy to open it up to questions. I have a few of my own, but I don't want to take any time. So just raise your hand and yes. I have a question about how the JNF went about commissioning or finding photographers, the photographers. and did it, was it happenstance, did people come mm -hmm. to them, they'd taken certain photographs they thought JNF might be interested in, mm -hmm. or was there a concerted effort to find photographers and essentially program them, tell them what they wanted them to well, do? Well, it was a little bit all of the above, right? So we have this growing local community. We have, <coughs> one of the important things to note here especially in the context of the 1930s, is that we have this exodus of Jewish photographers and artists coming out, escaping um, Germany and, of course, Europe during the 1930s. So a lot of really amazing artists find their way. You and I were talking about Helmer Lersky in that context. They find their way to Palestine, and through contacts, they, um, they begin to work with the funds. 
But I can also share with you that labor was a little bit complicated. There are correspondence in um, the Central Zionist Archive, for instance, that was a great source for that, that show how that might sound familiar to anyone who knows Israel. There's never enough money, and the photographers were never paid on time, and they were commissioned by both Keren Ayasod and Kakal when they went to shoot the same event. Like, the, there's, a, there's a sort of like enthusiastic hecticness to the work um, and if you were able to find your way to talk to the archivist at the time, Nathan Bistritsky, Nathan Bistritsky Agmon was the um, founding director, um, not the founding director, but um, a lead director that really shaped the archive as it was. If you could get to Bistritsky, then you were probably were able to get a commission. Um, so it wasn't amazing employment, but relatively to the issue of at the time, that was very limited in opportunities. It was a really important source. For sure. Okay. Yes. Other questions? Yes, sir. I think the uh, background for your story, fascinating story, is a piece of genius, which is that the Jewish Agency mm -hmm. for Palestine yeah. in 1920 was organized as a nascent state. Yes so that by 47, 48, they were ready to go. And when you consider the divisions that you're talking about, which you can see in Israel today, you know, all the way from Herut uh, over to Mapam, mm -hmm. Mapai, uh, and uh, they managed to function as a Jewish agency hoping for the state, but uh, it's, something that few national liberation movements, that none that I know of, have achieved. Mm -hmm. The <clears throat> effort was concentrated and reaching worldwide. And in the context of the photographic archive, it's fascinating to read <coughs> through how they saw themselves. What I found interesting, you know, you're talking about the Jewish agency, I've mentioned Keren Ayesod, there's Vito, the way that JNF was thinking consciously about marketing and PR in, in a way that, that we're used to thinking about this today, but PR as we know it now is something that only started to emerge in the world only during the 1920s, so not long before this. They were thinking about, well, how do we distinguish ourselves from Keren Ayesod? How do we not hurt our fundraising efforts, and how can we be distinguished from them, and how do we have offices across the world um, and offices that can distribute those propaganda materials. So there's like this deep intentional thinking about how to create an infrastructure that will be far-reaching worldwide and help sustain the fundraising efforts, because that's the main purpose of this thing. And it worked, you know, it, it worked. They were able to make it happen even though it was slightly chaotic on the inside as well. Absolutely. Yes. Other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, how much of the archive is accessible online, and is it a priority to get more of it? So thank you for reminding me. I wanted to mention that when you were, when you were talking about browsing through the archive. So the archivists at JNF for over a decade have been doing amazing work to digitize the materials and make as many materials as possible available online. Where this gets complicated is that the archive is only available in Hebrew. So if you don't write in Hebrew, if you don't speak Hebrew, it's very challenging to <coughs> search materials. Um, and you also have to kind of play around with the categories because what they've done, which I really appreciated was to, you know, you saw in my in my photographs the stickers on the on the right with the categories with the tags. Those are the initial categories that were developed by the original archivists. And current day archivists are trying to maintain those categories and write the images into the website in this way as well, while adding more tags. Okay, I'm nerding out about metadata. I'm sorry, but. Um, 
it's really interesting that you need to have command of the Hebrew language in order to be able to access those materials. But but they're available online and available for purchase as well. Other questions? Well, let me ask you. Oh, did somebody have one? I didn't see one. Okay, but so I... I'm going to throw oh, one more. Okay, well, you go you ahead. One. Okay. Um, postcards. Ooh, you yes. mentioned postcards. Yes, I talked about postcards. And um, postcards were a source of great controversy in the 1920s and the 1930s, especially um, Jewish postcards mm -hmm. showing images like the Dome of the Rock, mm -hmm. which the Muslims interpreted as a design to take over the Temple Mount and rebuild sure. the temple. So can you talk about the role of postcards Absolutely. Uh, and not just photos on postcards, but, but drawings and other images on postcards? Absolutely. Well. Um, postcards are a technology in and of themselves. Um, <laughs> When you, when you begin to, to delve into photo history, it's amazing the things that you get excited about, but <laughs> there's a specific moment where printing enables to mount photographs on postcards. And that moment, I'm sorry, I'm gonna get excited, changes visual culture forever. Mm. Because, um, and there are fascinating books about that. I didn't come up with that concept, although I kind of wish I had. Mm -hmm. um, that speaks about about postcards and photographs on postcards as the Victorian internet, like the first form of making someone absent present next to you. And immediately communities across the world and the Jewish, the Jewish use of postcards is really interesting in this way, um, in that regard, um, communities begin to shape an image of how they want to imagine their cities and their lives by utilizing postcards. Think of the Niagara Falls. Mm -hmm. I know exactly which image you have in your mind because it's the same image we've seen on all the postcards of the Niagara Falls since it was possible to create that image. Eiffel Tower, mm -hmm. same image. We all have it in our brains. So postcards become a relatively cheap way to tell stories about places and cement a particular image of communities and histories. Um, and Jewish communities have utilized that in a fascinating way beyond Palestine. There are collections of amazing postcards from Balkan communities in Greece, for instance, um, that show what happened after a large fire, but also show a prosperous community that the Zionist enterprise might not have been interested in talking about in the same way. So that's one way of thinking about the public forward-facing element of postcards. But think about how people also combine postcards into their family albums. The way that you align yourself politically um, and the way that you imagine your place within a national scope also gets translated into what you choose to include in your photo album. And that's where postcards that speak this larger collective language that we can all share also find its way into these really private, discrete spaces in a way that's really, really interesting. Well, thank you, Olympian. I have a couple of very basic questions and then we'll, we'll close um, that people might not have understood. So, and I didn't quite understand. So the fundraising mm -hmm. was to purchase land. land. That's what the Jewish National Fund was doing, right? They mm -hmm. were raising money to purchase land. And what was interesting to me is you showed a couple of photographs that, that you mentioned would be like communities on the fringe. Mm -hmm. And what was their purpose? I mean, they took these <coughs> photographs, obviously. They weren't necessarily going to use them for fundraising, I yeah. don't think, because yeah. they weren't the, the new Jew, the Sabra, the strong, the image that they wanted to project, right? But So what were they doing with those? But they might not convey the presence of the Sabra but they might show more clearly why the Sabra is this, or let's talk about the Chalutzim, not even the Sabra. Yeah. Who is this healthy pioneer. conqueror pioneer? And how is that body figure, that physique, is needed in order to build the land that was not maintained by its previous inhabitants mm -hmm. or by Jews of the old Yishuv? Or how is that, Pioneer, how does that pioneer help 
Holocaust survivors right. find their way into the into the so new. So that's why they would ideal. be showing those Absolutely. those other images. And my final question is about the limited number. Of, I don't. I haven't read your book, so I don't know Nora. how many. I'm sorry. <laughs> I will now, but I don't know how many um, mm -hmm. photographs you were able to include. But I was wondering if the archive itself was like very restrictive in terms of what they would let you um, photograph and, and mm -hmm. include in your book um, so, you know, to show f f to us or, or to other audiences. The book includes about 80 photographs. Oh. I would have included more, but the publishers were like, stop, please stop, just please, you can't. <laughs> um, and um, they don't all come from the JNF archive, as I, as I mentioned when I started. And I've also shown in this book a constellation of archival activity in Free State Palestine. Um, so there are photographs from private collections, there mm -hmm. are photographs from other archives as well. Um, the Genef archivists um, um, were completely okay with me using photographs that I took in the archive, um, but they were slightly more restrictive with um, allowing me to use images that came directly from the archive. Um, they wanted to guarantee that I would not use materials in a way that um, stands against um, their mission statement. Mm. Um, and it's, I think, a new thing that was not requested by um, colleagues of mine that have worked with the archive previously. Um, but they worked with me, responded, even though it was very difficult during COVID to get all the materials needed, um, we were in direct communication throughout the process. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Zipperstein. Thank you. Zipper so much. Steve. Thank you.